the ending of superhero trilogies, the disappointing follow-ups to two of the best superhero movies ever made, Spider-Man 3 vs. The Dark Knight Rises. Is that all you got? No. I came back to stop you. Yes. <sighs> Easily the two most popular hero from each franchise, Spider-Man vs. Batman. In The Dark Knight Rises, we have Christian Bale's Batman, a man who must be broken and rise up from his destruction. Overall, Batman has a great arc in this movie. He is truly beaten by Bane, and has to beat Bane through sheer force of will and unwillingness to let Bane win. It harkens back to the lesson Thomas Wayne wanted to teach Bruce in Batman Begins. And why do we fall, Bruce? So we can learn to pick ourselves up. Though I much prefer the way Rocky says it. But it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. That's how Batman beats Bane. Bane couldn't keep Batman down, just slow him down. On a more superficial note, Bale's Batman voice is still obnoxious, and his inability to close his mouth while in the Batman suit was really weird. Not everything. Not yet. That's just feckin' weird. Now onto Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man. I love his take on Peter Parker in the first two movies, and while his Spider-Man could have always been stronger, I do think it's more important to get Peter right than Spider-Man. Peter Parker is an audience viewpoint character. He's the guy we can relate to, the loser we want to win. For the most part, the missteps are how they chose to have Peter act under the influence of the black suit. When he starts out killing, at least he assumes he did, Sandman, that's exactly how I expect the suit to drive him. When he gets into a fight at the club and accidentally smacks Mary Jane, that's exactly what I would expect. When he gets into the fight with Harry at Harry's apartment, that works and is exactly what I would expect. What I don't expect is him to be walking around the street acting like an idiot. Part of the time, people act like he's being crazy, which is accurate. Then we have him apparently successfully hitting on Betty Grant, which seems out of nowhere. She certainly doesn't dislike him, but neither him nor her seem to be into each other in that way throughout the films. So it seems bizarre that she would be more into him if he acted like an idiot. Now dig on this. The dance and music number is beyond cringeworthy. However, him trying to make Mary Jane jealous makes sense. Just do it in any other way. Just being there on a date is being a jerk enough. And let us not forget the ultimate thing Peter Parker did to mark his descent into evil. Son of the devil, dude! The minor missteps in Bale's performance are nothing compared to the riding missteps of Peter Parker in Spider-Man 3. Point for DC. We both know that I have to kill you now. About the whole no guns thing, I'm not sure I feel as strongly about it as you do. In Spider-Man 3, we get Thomas Hayden Church's Sandman and Topher Grace's Venom. Let's start with Sandman because I have the least complaints about him. He kind of works pretty damn well. At first, I disliked how they incorporated him into Uncle Ben's death, but the way the situation was ultimately presented played well into the theme of forgiveness while also leaving Peter's actions allowing the thief to escape to still result in Ben's death. You could have taken that guy apart. Now he's going to get away with my money. I missed the part where that's my problem. Sandman's story is really cliche. I promise I'll make you healthy again. Whatever it takes, I'll get the money. But this Spider-Man universe that Sam Raimi made is fairly cheesy, so cliche fits it nicely. I love the scene where Sandman is learning to use his powers, not only learning how to use his newfound abilities, but also showing him having trouble holding onto his daughter's locket. He loves her and thinks he's saving her, but he is actually blind to the fact that he is losing her the more he follows this path. At the end, I wish Peter had told Sandman something along the lines of, I forgive you, but if I hear about you committing any more crimes and putting people in danger, 
and leave the statement unfinished with a moment of silence where Sandman simply nods his understanding and drifts away. Just forgiving him is not enough. How do we know he won't go out and rob more people? Overall, it's a fairly minor complaint. Sandman does work fairly well in this movie. But don't worry, we still have Venom to talk about. I want to make one thing absolutely clear. I think Topher Grace does everything he can with this role. Problem is, he is massively miscast. Eddie Brock does have a whininess to him. He is just a fuck-up who blames other people for his own fuck-ups. I come before you today humbled and humiliated to ask you for one thing. I want you to kill Peter Parker. That type of character is in Grace's wheelhouse. But Brock also has a menace. Brock is a whiny guy, but also a Hulk that towers over Peter Parker. Grace is taller than McGuire, but not massively so. But height has less to do with it. He has to have a level of intimidation that Grace doesn't have. Hell, imagine if Tom Hardy was cast as Venom for this movie. Hardy is almost a year older than Grace and can very easily carry intimidation as well as whininess. Of all the complaints I could lodge at that Venom movie, Hardy's performance certainly isn't one of them. And that character was well written in Spider-Man 3. It's a character that is largely faithful to the comic book. He works well as an antithesis to Peter, though he has no role in the themes of the movie. It's just so miscast and not even by a bad actor. Topher Grace is a good actor who is severely wrong for this role. Some roles just aren't meant for some actors. You won't cast Michael Rucker as Mary Poppins. I'm Mary Poppins, y'all! Okay, bad example. Let's get back to Tom Hardy with The Dark Knight Rises. His Bane and Marion Cotillard's Talia Al Ghul make up the movie's villains. Hardy's performance provides a great amount of menace. It also wasn't hurt by all the muscle he put on for the role. He was a master strategist and a real physical threat to Batman. Meanwhile, the twist revealed that Bruce's love interest, Miranda Tate, was actually Talia Al Ghul was a real surprise the first time I watched this movie. But we totally had sex. It was all a cruel ploy to gain your confidence. That was a cruel ploy? <laughs> Sign me up for another! With rewatching, it's clear she isn't the good Samaritan she pretends to be and is actually being as helpful as she is to make sure Bane's master plan, which really ends up being her master plan, is successful. I won't do it. All right, stop. Lucius, you'll kill this man and yourself, and you'll barely slow them down. Sure, Bane's sometimes tough to understand voice does hurt him a bit. Word of the truth about despair. As will you. There's a reason why this prison is the worst hell on earth. But not as bad as Topher Grace miscasting. Point for DC. What the hell? Spider-Man 3 is all about forgiveness. In fact, the parts of this movie that work the best run on this theme. Peter has to forgive Sandman, Harry and Peter have to forgive each other, and Eddie has to... Well, he has to be... Alright, Eddie doesn't work towards the theme at all. He is simply written as a good antithesis for Peter Parker. He's similar in a lot of ways, being awkward and a photographer, except where Peter always tries to do the right thing, Eddie always tries to do whatever will get him ahead. I think that's why Topher Grace was cast. They wanted someone who could channel energy similar to Tobey Maguire's Peter Parker. Problem is, that's not who Venom is, and the movie suffers for it. The Dark Knight Rises is all about fighting back. It's about being dragged down to your lowest point and having the courage to keep going. It happens to Bruce Wayne. Hell, it happens to the entire city of Gotham. The movie also draws a lot from Batman Begins, with the return of the League of Shadows and Bane's plan being to finish what Ra's al Ghul started. I do feel like this movie is rather overlong, and perhaps would have worked better as a two-parter. The story of Batman's fall and the story of Gotham being under siege feel like a fairly drastic tone change that exists in the same movie. It genuinely feels like two movies, even though it isn't. While the themes of Spider-Man 3 are much clearer, The Dark Knight Rises hits its theme a lot harder. Batman is in terrible shape at the beginning of the movie. The residual concussive damage to your brain tissue and the general scarred over quality of your body, I cannot recommend that you go hella skiing, Mr. Wayne. And keeps getting worse until he is completely broken, quite literally. He must then rebuild himself to be stronger than he was before. Bane is smarter and stronger. Batman can only win through force of will by not allowing himself to be beaten. Point for DC. I broke you. How have you come back? You think you're the only one who could learn the strength to escape? 
Spider-Man 3's effects have not aged well, although I don't recall them bothering me at the time. On the other hand, The Dark Knight Rises really has some uninspired camera work. Look at the hero shot showing Batman facing Bane. So you came back to die with your city. No. I came back to stop you. It should look epic, but instead it's just him standing there. Check out how much cooler the same exchange looks in The Last Jedi. So you came back to die with your city. No. Let's look at perhaps the biggest moment in the movie, where Bane breaks Batman's back. Here's the famous comic panel showing the event. It looks terrible for Batman, just as it should. It looks like Batman is seriously injured. Yet how does it look in this movie? <laughs> oh, your buddy! <laughs> The music tells us that it's a big deal, but the shot just looks like Batman rolling off Bane's knee. Add to it, the constant change in aspect ratios is really distracting. It's almost a change from shot to shot. And it's more a nitpick, but what the hell about the guy who was shot to death yet has no bullet wounds? What the hell is up with that? The Dark Knight Rises has the most boring cinematography of the entire Nolan trilogy. Sure, the football stadium explosion is fairly epic, but it's not enough. Spider-Man 3 may not have aged the best in the effects department, but at the time it worked. The visual storytelling with Sandman's origin is just fantastic, and some of the fight scenes with Sandman are very creative. I'm giving this point to Marvel. Where do all these guys come from? Action has never been Nolan's strength. However, he has gotten way better since Batman Begins. Better being that he at least shoots the fights so that the action is clear and not the jumbled mess that looks like concealment for bad choreography. However, the cinematography comes into play again here. Raimi has no problem whatsoever shooting an action scene with flair and style, whereas Nolan just shoots it without any real thought as to how it would look best, with more an interest in it looking coherent. Don't get me wrong, if you have to choose between coherent action and stylized action, please do coherent. But Raimi doesn't have to choose, and just does both wonderfully. On a side note, look at all the clearly fake fighting happening around Batman and Bane. You can notice that no one is dying around them. Everyone's standing and fighting each other. Cop and criminal all seem to be teamed up one-on-one -on -one fighting, and doing weird wrestling moves and not actually accomplishing anything. It looks terrible. Point for Marvel. In The Dark Knight Rises, we have Gary Oldman as Commissioner Gordon, Michael Caine as Alfred Pennyworth, Morgan Freeman as Lucius Fox, Anne Hathaway as Catwoman, Joseph Gordon-Levitt as Blake. Does it bug anyone else they didn't name Joseph Gordon-Levitt's character Richard Grayson? It wouldn't affect the script at all and would provide a great bit of fan service. Oh yeah, uh, try my legal name. You should use your full name. I like that name. Robin. However, his character does provide us with the idea that perhaps Batman can never die. Gordon has to lead a revolution once Bane takes control of Gotham. Lucius is largely just there to spout exposition. If you follow your entire R&D budget into a fusion project that you then mothball, your company is unlikely to thrive. Rotors are configured to maneuver between buildings without recirculation. Your majority keeps dangling at bay while we figure out a future for the energy program with Miranda Tate. What's it called? Oh, it has a long, uninteresting Wayne Enterprises designation. I just took to calling it the bat. Works fine. Except for the autopilot. Takes a better mind than mine to fix it. A better mind? Uh, I was trying to be modest. A less busy mind. Yours. Alfred does what he can to make sure Bruce tries to live his life after Batman rather than just die. It means your hatred, and it also means losing someone that I have cared for since I first heard his cries, but it might also mean saving your life. Catwoman works for whoever will pay her and manages to betray Batman and at the end does the right thing. In Spider-Man 3, we have James Franco as Harry Osborn, Kristen Dunst as Mary Jane Watson, Rosemary Harris as Aunt May, J.K. Simmons as J. Jonah Jameson, 
Bryce Dallas Howard as Gwen Stacy, and James Cromwell as Captain Stacy. Mary Jane is the same completely underdeveloped character she's been throughout these movies. She has a Broadway show, then is fired, and is upset when Pierre doesn't know about it, despite the fact she didn't tell him, though he is being rather inattentive. Still, she could tell him, but she doesn't for drama. Aunt May and Captain Stacy are relegated to spitting out exposition. The name is Flint Marco. He's a small-time cook. Gwen Stacy is there just because the story wanted another love interest. Jameson is there because Simmons is gray in the role, and more Simmons' Jameson is always better. They're smaller. Get on with you, boy! What? Your blood pressure, Mr. Jameson. Your wife told me to tell you to watch the anger. You tell my wife! Thank you. The real interesting supporting cast member in Spider-Man 3 is Harry Osborn. I was torn whether to put him in with the villains or here. He does star as a villain, then stops, then goes back to being a villain, then goes good for the climax. Since he ended as a hero, I decided to place him here. Harry Osborn's arc in this movie manages to be a good example of how all over the place the movie's quality is. It starts out exactly where Spider-Man 2 left off. Harry just learned about his father being the Green Goblin, and now he's taking the drugs to become the next Green Goblin, or New Goblin as the credits call him. He gets into a decent fight with Peter on the street where he suffers an injury. Now it starts to get shitty because he has amnesia and is a good guy again, and it's just as stupid as it sounds. Then he regains his memory after a pointless scene of him and Mary Jane making breakfast. Then it gets worse. He decides his first act of villainy, now that he's back, is to fuck around with Peter and Mary Jane's relationship in all the most cliche ways possible. Well, that's why I asked you here, Pete. I'm the other guy. It finally starts to feel back on track when Harry and Peter end up in a nasty fight at Harry's place where he gets badly scarred. Then it ends fairly strong with Harry's hero's sacrifice. He spent his whole life in his father's shadow. Finally, his final act. He dies being the good man he wants to be instead of the evil man his father wanted him to be. Harry's arc starts fine, goes stupid, goes into really stupid, then strong, then ends on a strong note. Unfortunately, the earlier stuff was so bad that the strong ending isn't strong enough to make up for all the shit in the middle. A lot like this movie. I feel like a nice chunk of Harry's storyline was written by a shitty soap opera writer. It is also a detriment to Harry's arc how Bernard reveals to Harry that Norman's glider was what killed him. For one thing, it is fully possible that Spider-Man threw the glider at Norman. For another, it would be so much more powerful if Harry forgave Peter while still thinking Peter killed his father. Perhaps Bernard could tell a story about how they were children and Harry had something taken away and Peter went to get it back and was beaten up for it. Something to remind Harry that Peter has been his best friend, and whenever he needs something, Peter has been there. This would only enhance his already strong death as well. Considering my biggest complaint about The Dark Knight Rises is Joseph Gordon-Levitt's character's name, point for DC. Mr. Wayne? I'm sorry they took all your money. No, you're not. Spider-Man 3 loses Danny Elfman, who scored the first two films, and gains Christopher Young. To his credit, if you never told me that Danny Elfman left, I won't have assumed he did Spider-Man 3. Young does a great job of emulating Elfman's style. I particularly love the jazz number played for Harry and Peter's fight at the apartment. It perfectly fits with Rami's world. Unfortunately for Spider-Man 3, The Dark Knight Rises is a Hans Zimmer score. It's really good. It's not The Dark Knight good, but it is really good all the same. Listen to the raw intensity of Jim Gordon looking into a truck. The scene by itself is planned. <laughs> but add some Hans Zimmer, and it feels like an action scene. The music gives the final fight between Batman and Bane the epic feel that the cinematography lacks. I doubt even if Elfman did the score for Spider-Man 3, he would have had a chance. Sound design-wise, both movies work well, meaning it's down to the scores again, and it's hard to overthrow Hans Zimmer. Point for DC.
These are two fairly underrated movies. Spider-Man 3 at strongest is almost as good as Spider-Man 2 at its best. Never quite reaching that height, but getting up there. Some of the best moments of the entire franchise are in Spider-Man 3. Romance. I am French. But all the lowest points of the franchise are here too. You could throw some crap at the first two for their excessive cheesy moments, but nothing compares to the whole Peter dancing shtick, Harry's amnesia, Harry's plan to mess with Peter's relationship, and that utterly bizarre breakfast scene. It's all so bad. How's the pie? So good. I don't think Spider-Man 3 is a bad movie, I just don't think it's a good one either. On the other hand, The Dark Knight Rises is actually a good movie. Sure, I could throw some shade at it, like how during Gotham's lockdown, Bruce just pops up in the middle of town with no explanation. Just a line saying he's got ways of sneaking around town without anyone noticing would have been nice. I guess you can just assume he's Batman, so sure, whatever. But a line would be nice. His inability to close his mouth when in his Batman costume is just weird. Honestly, Christian Bale is great in this movie out of costume, but in costume, it's like he forgets that he's a good actor. He even uses his Batman voice when he talks to himself, apparently. Miss Kyle. So that's what that feels like. They are both the worst chapter in their respective trilogies, but The Dark Knight Rises is definitely the better movie. He's another pair of panties. I totally hid these from you. When you were in the John. So good. That's a lot of memories. Hey, if you like this video, please make sure to hit that like button and go ahead and subscribe. That helps me out a lot. And if you really love this video, consider visiting my Patreon page. 